Hello Penguin Arts, I'm the Beardy Penguin and welcome back to For All Kerbal Kind, continuing our plight into 1955 with yet another flight of the Ha 3, flown by Raphael Kerman, just completing yet another of those supersonic flight contracts. I know you're probably tired of seeing Ha 3 flights by this point, but we've almost completed all of the contracts that this aircraft is actually capable of completing, so you're not going to see too many of them in this episode, but they're a very reliable source source of funding, so we're just going to be continuing to complete them just so we can keep getting as many uh, Kerbal Construction Time upgrade points invested in our Space Center as possible, giving us an edge over those Americanskis. Of course, in the previous episode, we launched the world's first artificial satellite, but the Americans were hot on our heels, launching Explorer 1 just a few months later. So we cannot rest on our laurels, and we're going to be neck and neck throughout 1955 and 1956, because yes, We've decided to dispense with the one year per episode sort of thing, uh, so now it's just going to be incorporating as many achievements as, as we sort of deem necessary. But another perfectly routine flight of the Ha 3 with Raphael at the controls. He is an ace at this point and landing nice and gently on the runway at Baikonur, completing ourselves into another contract and getting ourselves some more funding. So we're going to grab ourselves the world's first solar powered satellite contract. Now, yes, of course. Um, <laughs> Sputnik 2 was solar powered, but it was not a long duration satellite. It was merely just sort of a test of the capabilities. Um, and the solar power is only really there to extend its lifetime for a while. But while we're constructing that, we're actually going to launch a suborbital mission because we still have one R7 rocket lying around. This is the uh, less than optimal <laughs> launch vehicle we use to put Sputnik 2 into orbit. And not gonna lie, I hate this thing. <laughs> I hate it. We gimped our way into orbit using it. Um, and a lot of people were commenting on my less than optimal gravity turn. That's just because the thrust to weight ratio in the first stage is so insane. It is impossible to do the gravity turn any earlier without causing the entire rocket to disintegrate. But we're just using the last R7 we had lying around, um, which we constructed while we were waiting for <laughs> actual orbital class rocket engines to unlock. Um, we're using this to complete a simple suborbital advanced biological experiment contract. So it's basically launching a small dog on a suborbital trajectory. Um, I almost removed the third stage, and then I remembered just how unreliable this second stage engine is, so I decided to keep it just in case the second stage engine actually just didn't ignite. Uh, we still had a performance loss on it, but it was still more than enough to get us up into space, complete the contract, and then I decided to fire it a little longer, just sort of maybe get a bit more data on the engine, but then after a while I thought, ah, you know what, nope, we're not gonna, <laughs> we're not gonna push our luck and wait for the engine to explode, we're just gonna decouple the biological sample and return the dog safely to the Earth. Slightly overbuilt rocket really for this purpose, but I mean, we, we had it 90% complete by the time we unlocked orbital rocketry. Um, we were constructing it just in case Sputnik 2's launch still didn't go to plan. Um, so I thought we might as well use it for something we know it's definitely capable of doing. I wasn't going to stick an expensive satellite on there and try and complete any of our more ambitious satellite contracts because honestly, it is a minor miracle that the R7 managed to get uh, Sputnik 2 into space at all, so <laughs> we're not going to be using it anymore because I hate it as a launch vehicle and we are now going to get designing a much more capable launch vehicle, the R8. So we're going to be putting our new RD-108 and RD-211 engines to use on an actual capable launch vehicle, something that doesn't have to overburn its second stage engine, something like 250% of its rated burn time to get into orbit. And it's introducing a number of small innovations as well. So I'll walk you through it as we're watching a time lapse of its construction. So to begin with, the engines have got much longer rated burn times and we're not actually going to be going anywhere near them since we still have a 60 ton limit on the rockets that we can launch from our launch pad. Um, so that means that the chance of these engines failing is significantly lower. Not only that, but their specific impulses, since they are no longer simply pressure-fed engines and they're using kerosene instead of ethanol, um, the specific impulse is actually now breaking the 300 seconds mark, which is a massive increase in performance over the simple RD-103 engines uh, and S2 engines we were using previously. Not only that, but I've decided that uh, the upper stage, as well as being you know, spin stabilized like before, is actually going to have some reaction control thrusters on it, which means 
means that um, since the second stage is you know still a little bit too powerful uh, for its own good for you know an optimum ascent profile the second stage the engine is going to cut off and then we can actually coast all the way up to our apoapsis before launching the final kick stage spin stabilized of course into the final orbit still using a liquid fueled kick stage mainly because a lot of our contracts require very specific orbital parameters specific inclinations and specific eccentricity um, along with a few of our science experiments as well so what I wanted to do was uh, was be able to control the orbit that we end up in Solid field kick stages um, are all nice and well, uh, but you don't have all that much control over the final orbit you end up in. Um, a lot of people actually kind of complained about the green, <laughs> the green and red color scheme on all my previous rockets. So I thought now we're going to go with a nice silver and red color scheme instead. While we're actually constructing the R8, we unlocked early avionics and probes, which means we can now actually have our first long-term satellites. The power consumption has been reduced by something like 99.4%. So with a few solar panels on our design, we can actually have a satellite that can remain operational, not just for a few days, but actually perpetually, at least until the solar panels um, degrade, which is actually something modeled in realism overhaul. But it will be operating more than long enough to complete its onboard scientific experiments. So this mission is actually hoping to not only complete the world's first uh, solar powered satellite, Contract. The reason why that contract wasn't completed by Sputnik 2 is because it needed uh, orbital parameters that the R7 could not achieve. Uh, but we're also hoping to complete the world's first scientific satellite contract, which is actually uh, something with a huge reward payment, something sort of mirroring um, the launch of Explorer 1 in reality. So the R8 actually ends up performing absolutely beautifully. It took most of 1955 to actually build it since we did extra pre-flight checks and extra telemetry on these engines since this is a first test of this launch vehicle after all but it ends up operating flawlessly after of course the second stage engine burns out we activate the reaction control thrusters and then coast for a couple of minutes up to our apoapsis that's the point at which we then fire the third stage spin stabilizing it and push ourselves into a final orbit but yeah i was really almost embarrassingly proud of how well this launch vehicle actually worked out it is so much better than the r7 uh, it made me very very happy really the r7 was a colossal waste of money because we had to tool and research and construct a very suboptimal vehicle and then pretty much immediately design yet another one um, with tooling costs being a thing you really want to be using launch vehicles that you design as much as you can and extending their lifetime and stretching the tanks etc you know designing a vehicle that actually has future capabilities in mind um, whereas we yeah we designed the r7 just to get sputnik into orbit ahead of the americans which worked but uh yeah it was a waste of around about 70,000 funds, which is quite a lot. Still though, we now have the R8 and it has successfully placed Sputnik 3 into orbit, completing not only the solar powered satellite contract, but the scientific satellite contract as well. Though it's going to take a few days for the scientific satellite contract to actually complete because it has to transmit some scientific data first. Scientific data, including micrometeorite detection and also the Geiger Muller counter experiment, which is detecting the presence of the Van Allen radiation belts. Unfortunately, the Americans actually beat us to discovering those though. Anyway, our next contract is going to be a polar orbit satellite. We're going to try and see if we can get one of those into space before the Americans. But in the meantime, we're doing yet another flight of the Ha 3, this time flown by Alexander. Now, this final contract is actually really pushing the limits of this aircraft. So this is intended to be the final contract that we actually complete, since these supersonic contracts are getting higher and faster faster and faster and it's really pushing the limit of what the Ha 3 can actually manage but we managed to complete the contract uh, without too many problems the only problem left is to actually return home safely however with the extreme velocities we had to maintain for three minutes we're experiencing some serious overheating on the capsule and actually on the glide back to the space center after the main burn is finished the capsule actually finally succumbs to thermal stresses and completely disintegrates, killing Alexander instantly.
Upon receiving the news, close friend of Alexander, Raphael Kerman, decides to transfer out of the Khar program and to our newly opened launch site in Plisetsk. Its latitude making it ideal for future polar orbit satellite launches, as well as its proximity to Western Europe and Scandinavia, making it perfect for spy, pl I mean, um, <clears throat> weather plane flights, which we will be conducting later on in the episode. Heading back over to Baikonur though, our scientific satellite contract has now completed and we use the funds to begin constructing a 150 ton launch pad, something we'll definitely need for lunar probe missions in future episodes. Moving on, we've also unlocked Mature Supersonic Flight, which gives us the J-57 Turbojet, and we're grabbing ourselves the Carmen Line contract, which allows us to upgrade mission control, something we will also need for upcoming lunar probe missions. But in the meantime, we're going to make our Polar Orbit satellite attempt with Sputnik 4. And I do apologize uh, for this launching in the dark. It does make it very hard to see at the start, especially with YouTube's uh, compression. But don't worry, we, you should be able to see it uh, about a minute or so into flight. The reason why I launched it uh, at the very break of dawn is because, well, it is heading into a polar orbit and I wanted to make sure that the solar panels were pretty much perpendicular uh, to the sun. So at least at first um, it can take full advantage of those panels and we can get all the scientific data that we want to get out of it. Now this mission actually has two new scientific instruments on it. A early television camera as well as a giant magnetometer boom. Now the boom actually, uh, yeah, it offset the mass so much that I strapped a second battery onto the side as well as the early television camera um, onto the opposite side of the satellite to try and balance out the center of mass since it's rather important as <laughs> the final stage is spin stabilized. We couldn't exactly have an offset center of mass. And of course the R8 actually performs flawlessly once again. We still haven't quite got the ascent profile down. Um, I had a little too steep an ascent profile here, but uh, I'm getting the hang of it. The R8 is much, much easier to fly than the R7 was. Uh, it has a much more reasonable thrust to weight ratio in the first stage at least. Um, so it's much easier to do a more gentle gravity turn, something you really want to be starting quite early in realism overhaul. Once again though, using our RCS thrusters to position ourselves along the relevant horizon and then firing off the third stage engine and placing our satellite into a nice circular orbit. Of course the uh, magnetometer boom does offset the center of mass slightly so we're wasting a bit of fuel with some rather aggressive uh, oscillations there but still we managed to get the satellite into orbit regardless. This uh, RM65 actually proving its worth There's a third stage, you know, just sort of kick stage engine. It still has better performance um, and specific impulse than any relevant solid rocket boosters would have which gives us the edge with putting satellites into space. The magnetometer boom once extended though does sort of make uh, <laughs> the satellite process rather chaotically so I'm not sure quite how valuable the data from our television camera is going to be but being in a polar orbit also uh, means the television camera gets to get data from all sorts of different biomes so it's quite a high return on science. Next, we're going to grab ourselves a Sun Synchronous Satellite contract, as well as grabbing ourselves Entry, Descent and Landing, 1958 Orbital Rocketry, and Lunar Range Communications Tech to begin researching over the coming year. Heading back over to Plisetsk, we're going to invest some more of our funds into KCT upgrade points. We want to try and get this capable of producing orbital class rockets within the year, but for now, it's only going to be completing very simple 20-ton rockets, while our main launch site at Baikonur is working working on much larger projects. Regardless though, this is the weather plane that I mentioned earlier, the KPNK2 Glaz. Yes, I'm actually gonna start using Russian words as names for my various different missions and aircraft. Glaz translating simply to I. I'm sorry to any Russian speakers. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure I'm gonna be butchering a lot of Russian terms here, but uh, I think it's more exciting than the previous naming schemes that I've been going with. Now, the thing is, Baikonur does not have many biomes nearby to it, right? And there are a lot of different biomes we haven't got any science from. And with the unlocking of our television camera, which also has biome-specific science, as well as the fact that we haven't even got 
planetary photography from most of the biomes on Earth, um, there's a lot of science just sort of waiting there for us to grab it. And we're actually, um, you know, short of us launching some probes to the moon, we don't have many more sources of science in low Earth orbit, at least for a while until we unlock some more experiments. So this is the most easily accessible way of getting ourselves a bunch of science and making sure that we're continuing to unlock tech at a rapid pace. So I decided to open the Blasetsk launch facility because it is in close proximity to not only Western Europe, you know, for <laughs> obvious reasons, but also it's in close proximity to a bunch of different biomes. Western Europe not only has plains, biomes, grasslands, it also has mountains in the form of the Alps. We have Scandinavia. We have also the Arctic Circle, which has its own biome. So really, we wanted to create a high altitude, long range aircraft that could take photographs and get us all the different biome specific science that we could ever want. And well, that sort of mission profile basically led to me constructing a U-2. Yes, I know it's a, <laughs> historically it's an American aircraft, um, but it's pretty much exactly the design that we needed for this purpose. And in this timeline, let's just say the U-2 is a Soviet design. See, the Soviets didn't really employ that many um, high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft because, after all, the U.S. did not have closed borders the same way that the Soviets did. So they didn't really have to use spy planes and spy satellites, at least to the same extent, in order to gather intelligence. But let's just say in this timeline that the U.S. and Western Europe have slightly more fortified borders to Soviet agents, and as such, the Politburo has deemed it necessary for Kaputnik to develop a spy play, a uh, weather plane. Yes, the red star on the side, I'm sure, uh, <laughs> doesn't give away the nation that's constructed it whatsoever. But regardless, this is now going to be Raphael's job, flying high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft over enemy territory. So in this first flight, we've actually got quite an ambitious flight plan. We're going to head out over the Baltic Sea and head out over Scandinavia, over Sweden and Norway and even Finland, and then head up north to the Arctic Circle, get a little bit of Arctic biome science and then fly all the way back round to Plesetsk. It's going to be a roughly five, six hour long flight, um, but thankfully, of course, I can use Time Accelerate, uh, and I did for the majority of this flight just go and make a cup of tea, and I think I even did my laundry while this plane was flying, so I just sort of left it flying uh, and went and did a few other things, because it is a beautifully stable aircraft with a maximum altitude of, I think, about 20 kilometers, although I didn't push it that high. Uh, I just pushed it up to about 18 kilometers, or roughly 60,000 feet, which is very close to the actual U-2's operational altitude, far away from most current surface-to-air missile uh, ranges, although I'm not too worried about Norway or Sweden shooting us down. Regardless though, I was actually off making a cup of chamomile when we encountered some problems over the Baltic Sea. Yes, it turns out uh, although the aircraft is fully capable of making this flight with a fuel time of about 21 hours, we did not include enough oxygen for Raphael to actually complete that flight, so we're going to have to turn around and head back to the runway. Unfortunately, though, we don't actually have enough oxygen to make it back, so we're going to have to fly below 10 kilometers, which is the point at which uh, our pilots actually need supplementary oxygen. So I, I came back and suddenly see all these Kerbalism warnings, like <laughs> Raphael is struggling to breathe, running out of oxygen, CO2 scrubbers are failing. Uh, yeah, it's like that, that meme with Donald Glover from Community, walking back into the room and everything's on fire. Um, yeah, we had glaring warnings all over the cockpit and yes of course we immediately dive the aircraft as gently as possible since it has rather long flimsy wings and it uh, definitely has a speed limit too too fast and this aircraft wings do like to rip off it can't take many g's it's not a half plane after all it is a high altitude reconnaissance aircraft so we do thankfully though manage to dive below 10 kilometers in time to stop Raphael from suffocating and I decide actually we're going to take a little detour and get a bunch of biome science over the coast, getting our television camera science and another 0.4 science points that we can then invest into some technology.
Unfortunately though, upon the flight back to the launch site, since we're actually flying at a lower altitude to stop ourselves ripping the wings off, we needed to run the engine at a lower thrust level, which means the alternator isn't producing quite as much electricity, which means I then realized we have about seven minutes of electric charge left. This is really bad. If the aircraft runs out of electric charge, then we're not going to be able to control it whatsoever. And with our current astronaut complex upgrades, we would not be able to bail Raphael out. He would merely keep <laughs> flying, since the aircraft is naturally stable, until he ran out of fuel and then plummet into the ground. So then it was a bit of a race to land the aircraft as fast as possible in a random field. You know, as, as first flights go, um, not that great, but it's not a complete bust flight. We still got a fair bit of useful data, especially from our new television camera experiment. And thankfully the plane touched down safely on some nice flat terrain and we can recover the aircraft back to the launch site. So, not, not an ideal first flight. We didn't even make it across the Baltic Sea, but uh, we'll just tell the higher ups. It was merely a test flight and some more work is needed. In fact, we actually need to unlock a new technology, crew survivability, before we can even put supplementary oxygen on the aircraft. So it is going to be another year before this aircraft flies again. Pushing onwards though, we're going to be cancelling the supersonic flight contract that unfortunately killed Alexander and grabbing ourselves the Lunar Flyby contract, using the advanced funds to purchase the hypersonic aircraft parts that we have just unlocked. We'll be using those to construct the HAR-4, learning from the lessons of the HAR-3's unfortunate fate, but that will actually be in the next episode because believe it or not, constructing space planes is really rather difficult. But at the beginning of next year, 1957, hopefully we'll be able to send a Kerbal through the Kármán line. But before we can do that though, we have a few more launches. This is the Sputnik 5 heading into solar synchronous orbit. Now solar synchronous orbit is something that's really rather interesting because it's not technically modeled in Kerbal Space Program, but I'll have a little chat about it later on. So, launching yet again early on in the day, trying to get ourselves um, up into an orbit where we're sort of perpendicular to the sun, so our solar panels get the maximum amount of exposure. And heading into an inclination of around 97 degrees or so, that it means we do have to launch slightly retrograde, leaving us with a very narrow delta V margin. Unfortunately though, we have our first R8 launch failure with the second stage engine failing to ignite and with only a single ignition, that spells doom for the mission. So unfortunately Sputnik 5 ends up plummeting back to the Earth. I do actually try to regain control of the second stage using the reaction control thrusters, but they're really very weak and with the entire second stage fully fueled, we don't really have much of a hope of regaining control. But I thought I might as well just fire the third stage just to get a little bit more engine data on that RM65, which is really now becoming a very reliable kick stage engine for us. But uh, unfortunately, the mission is a complete bust and we'll have to try again in another few months. In the meantime though, our mission control upgrade has now finished, allowing us to have up to seven active contracts. So we're grabbing ourselves the Advanced Biological Suborbital Experiment contract, as well as Lunar Orbiter and Impactor contract, giving us a huge amount of advanced funding. As well as that, I can now actually show you what our Plisetsk vehicle assembly building has been working on. This is the R9. and You'd think higher number, the larger rocket, but uh, no, the Placetsk launch site only has a 20 ton launch pad. However, we don't need a 60 ton launch vehicle to complete these simple biological suborbital experiment contracts. We just need to launch a small dog on a rather uh, <laughs> rather powerful rocket, but still not a fully orbital class rocket. We just had to get up to, I believe, about 3,000 meters per second um, of orbital velocity and then return the dog safely to the ground. So this is sort of like preliminary contracts before we send one into orbit, hopefully in the next episode. So I went with a black and red sort of color scheme here. Since we actually have another team working on it, I guess they wanted to make themselves distinct. However, we're using the RD211 an engine here which has a ridiculously high thrust to weight ratio for such a small rocket. 
which makes it really, really difficult to control. Uh, <laughs> means we have a very, very late gravity turn, but this rocket, after all, isn't actually going into orbit. It just simply needs to get to space and to a high enough velocity for us to complete the contract. And then we can return the capsule back nice and safely. So this is what the Placette launch site is going to be working on. Uh, we're just going to be launching simple small suborbital rockets and then investing the funds that we get from these contracts back into the vehicle assembly building, hopefully upgrading it to a point where it can start launching polar satellites. Since, of course, a higher latitude does make that a little bit easier with regards to the amount of Delta V it requires. So, thankfully, this mission is actually a complete success and we return Doggo safely to the ground. Much more suitable uh, to this sort of launch profile, the R9, than, uh, than the R7 was. That was a bit of a bit of a janky sort of use of an R7 we had lying around. But now we have a specific rocket designed for this purpose. And we get our funding and invest it back into the VAB KCT points at Plesetsk. Then we're going to grab ourselves another of those biological contracts and actually get working on another R9 in the meantime, as well as now finally having enough science to unlock or at least begin researching crew survivability so that we can actually use the glass for its intended purpose in the next episode. But we've actually accumulated a huge amount of advanced funding, which we're going to invest into an R&D center upgrade. Now that's 500,000 funds, but since it's going to take quite a while to actually complete that upgrade, we wanted to be investing that earlier rather than later so that we don't have any interruptions in our tech progression. So now another attempt attempt at our Sun Synchronous Satellite, but uh, unfortunately this satellite launch comes with a little bit of heavy news. The Americans have launched a lunar impact probe while we are still messing around in low Earth orbit, which comes as a bit of a slap in the face. We've sort of been comforted by our advantage over the Americans, but they've managed to complete something we don't even have the technology to attempt yet. Lunar flybys and lunar impacts weren't something that was even on my radar at this point. So the fact that the Americans have achieved that um, is a little concerning, and that will have given them a massive funding advantage over us. So um, um, they are going to be hot on our heels now and almost certainly closing any initial advantage we got by uh, by launching the first satellite a little ahead of them. So a little concerning, but uh, we've actually been diverting our attention elsewhere into human space flight, developing the HAR-4, which I did design and begin building this episode, but unfortunately didn't quite finish before the end of 1957. Um, so, you know, the fruits of our labors throughout this year are really going to sort of come to fruition in the next year and in the next episode. But thankfully we have a successful launch of Sputnik 6 into a solar synchronous orbit. Something which, as I said earlier, isn't modelled by Noble Kerbal Space Program because in real life, the Earth actually has an equatorial bulge, which means that something in an inclined circular orbit experiences a varying acceleration due to gravity, creating a torque on the orbit, which actually causes the orbit to process, so the ascending and descending nodes to actually move from west to east. East. You can actually derive a very complicated equation that we did in one of my astronautics modules last year, which you can resolve for the orbital altitude and inclination necessary to create a rate of precession equal to 360 degrees every year. And that means that the orbit essentially remains fixed relative to the sun, which means you pass over the same point on the Earth at the same local solar time every single day. And that is really useful for a number of different Earth observation payloads. But regardless, that is the end of the episode. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. I do hope you've enjoyed. Be sure to check out N9's video. It will be linked in the end screen. You can go see how he managed to beat us to the moon. And I will see you all next time.